Welcome to the Manhattan Institute's event on local journalism and the health of local democracy. I'm Michael Hendricks, Director of State and Local Policy here at the Manhattan Institute, and we are honored to be joined today by some of America's leading journalists, editors, publishers, and scholars for this important conversation. Local journalism believes, we believe, serves an indispensable role in local democracy. But in recent decades, these local outlets have declined dramatically. And the result have been growing news deserts that pose real dangers to this American project. Our event will proceed in two parts. First, a panel on news deserts and their effect on local democracy, moderated by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Judith Miller. And then a discussion helmed by our very own Howard Husuck and how we can sustain journalism in the modern media landscape. Now, two quick programming notes. Throughout our event, please enter any of the questions that you have on any of the platforms you're watching us on, and we'll incorporate that in the discussion. And also, please consider subscribing uh, to our newsletters. We're making a contribution to the Manhattan Institute's mission. Uh, we should be posting links for doing so right in the comments window. And now it's my great pleasure to be introducing Judith Miller to kick things off. Judy is an adjunct fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a City Journal uh, contributing editor, Fox News commentator, a best-selling author, and a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter formerly with the New York Times. Needless to say, she's accomplished a lot in her long career. In 2005, she spent 85 days in jail to protect her confidential news sources. And relevant to our discussion today, wrote in 2018 how no news is bad news. That was the title of her report as America's uh, newspapers were buckling under financial and structural pressures. And this panel will go straight to that challenge. And so now, Judy, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. It's my pleasure to be here with so many distinguished colleagues, and I want to thank all of them and all of you for tuning in to discuss this important topic. I would start with just one in brief introductory note that I owe to Michael Hendricks, who wrote a very interesting and provocative piece about the disappearance of local newspapers, and that is that this summer, the Capital Gazette which was an Annapolis, Maryland-based newspaper, which was founded in 1727. It was among the first publishers uh, of the Declaration of Independence. It closed its doors after being published by, uh, purchased by the uh, Tribune uh, Publishing Company. And it uh, also was the place, you may recall, where a disgruntled uh, reader and staffer, extra uh, staffer, walked into the newsroom and shot up the newsroom, killing five of his colleagues. That paper uh, does not exist except in name only. Its news reporters were operating from home until recently. That phenomenon is what I want to dis discuss today with a distinguished panel of, of uh, colleagues and people who have studied this issue and are worried about it. I wanna introduce them to you. The first is Penny Muse Abernathy, whom I once worked with at the New York Times. She is the night chair in journalism and digital media economics at the University of North Carolina, the director of the Center of Innovation and Sustainability in Local Media. And Penny has had a distinguished career, both in journalism and now in academia is the person who really popularized the term news desert. And we owe to her the uh, term ghost papers, which is newspapers that are kind of there in name only, that they don't actually function providing news. And uh, I will uh, turn to Penny in a moment after introducing Steve Engelberg, who was the founding managing editor of ProPublica in 20. Uh, 2008. And before that, he was at the New York Times. He was my editor. He is my co-author. He is one of the most brilliant investigators I have ever had the pleasure to work with. He also put up with me and a bunch of other uh, impossible uh, investigative reporters for way too many years. Uh, the New York Times' loss was ProPublica's gain, which he has turned into a giant, giant uh, in journalism and indispensable especially in this era without local news and a lot of investigative reporting. And finally, I'd like you to meet Nico Mele, 
uh, who is one of America's leading forecasters. He combines that rare expertise in both business with politics and culture and journalism in our media age, our digital age. He is the managing director at the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation. He's also still on the faculty of uh, Harvard Business uh, Kennedy School, uh, where I initially talked to him about the fate of local journalism, and he gave me more ideas and more information about what was going on in the country than I could possibly fit into my monograph. But thank you to all of you. Now, Penny, I would like to return to you since you have looked at news deserts from the very beginning. And I want to know now, uh, if you would give us an overview, how, how wide and how deep are these news deserts? What are the major trends? And what do you see out there in America happening to local journalism? Well, thanks, Judy. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, I appreciate the Manhattan Institute continuing to focus on the notion that no news is actually bad news. Uh, there are two ways to look at the loss of uh, local news. One is the loss of newspapers. And over the last 15 years, prior to uh, the pandemic, we had lost roughly a fourth of our newspapers. Uh, most of those newspapers are what we would call weeklies or non-dailies, and they served mid, small and mid-sized communities. So one way to think about the loss of a newspaper is that when you lose a, uh, a newspaper in a small or mid-sized communities, community, what you're really losing is the reporter that shows up to cover the school board meeting. It shows up to cover the county commissioner meeting. Uh, there's been a lot of research that has shown that when you lose a local newspaper, voter participation goes down, invariably taxes go up because no one's there running the second calculator on uh, bond issues and the like. Uh, so there is a, a loss of transparency, a loss of knowledge of what's actually occurring, and uh, in general, a loss to grassroots democracy. The second way to look at the loss of news is the loss of actual reporters. And based on what the Bureau of um, Labor Statistics comes out with between in the decade between 2008 and 2018, uh, we lost half of the newspaper new, uh, journalists that we had. Uh, most of the loss has been at the state and regional level. So when you're losing a reporter at a, a major uh, metro or at a state paper or at a regional paper, what you're really losing are the reporters who cover broad topics and often did uh, the analytical pieces as well as the investigative reporting. Uh, the FCC in uh, 2012 pulled together a group of uh, scholars from across the uh, disciplines, uh, from political science all the way over to business, to identify what are the what is the information we need, you and I need, anybody living in a city or even in the smallest crossroads needs in order to make good quality of life decisions on a daily basis. And they identified tw uh, eight topics ranging from uh, news about education and the environment and health all the way over to news about politics, governments and uh, public safety and even economic development. So if you think about it, you lose a reporter on a daily, um, a small daily, you're losing the person who shows up at those routine government meetings that often come up with stories that are of immense impact and interest to us, not only uh, today, but to perhaps future generations too. Uh, and that really hampers our ability to make wise decisions. When you lose a reporter on a state and regional uh, paper, what you're losing are the reporters that really bind us together, bind regions together, bind states together, highlight the important issues to the investigative reporting that results in not just policies that affect a local community, but affect a state and regional um, community, uh, state, many communities in the state and region. Um, what is driving this? Two things. Um, one uh, is being driven by the, the collapse of the for-profit business model and the failure to develop a digital model that uh, contributes as much um, revenue and income to local news operations, whether you're a digital startup or whether you're a newspaper, as we had uh, even in, 2000 and, uh, uh, in the year 2000. 
the second thing that is driving this is the massive consolidation that goes on. Uh, we see that in mature industries. Consolidation often occurs as people try to gain what synergies of, uh, around cost. Uh, the problem has been, though, is that we have some of the largest chains we've ever had. It, there's a real disconnect uh, between the community where a, a small local newspaper is located and the corporate structure, uh, which could be located anywhere in the U.S. Uh, and as a result of the consolidation, we've lost a number of newspapers that have been merged, consolidated, and just quite frankly gone out of business. Uh, as a result of this, the, the cost of buying a newspaper is uh, very, very small today. It, it, and prior to 2008, uh, we had, uh, if you wanted to buy a local newspaper, you typically paid 13 times earnings, which meant you were making a real com uh, commitment to the community where you had a newspaper. Today, uh, it is not uncommon to pay uh, one or two times earnings or even just pay a percentage of revenue uh, to get it. Many family-owned newspapers, independent newspapers, uh, are having trouble finding buyers. And as a result, we're losing both our independent newspapers that were on the ground, as well as uh, the uh, newspapers that um, uh, can't be bought. Uh, thank you, Penny. Uh, I have a couple of questions I want you to think about. Uh, one, uh, but just think about it because I want to move on to our next okay. panelist. Uh, one is social media responsible in part for the collapse of uh, journalism and two, ha what has the pandemic accelerated this trend? But we'll, right. we'll refer to that. Uh, my second speaker, Steve Engelberg. Uh, Steve, I hope you'll address the issue of investigative reporting, which is so vital, especially at the local level. Uh, what's the impact of the news desert phenomenon on investigative news? What is ProPublica trying to do about it? And can ProPublica or any single news organization really substitute for local generated independent investigative journalism? Well, first of all, Julie, I'd like to thank the Manhattan Institute for having, having me on in this panel. I think this is really important uh, to talk about because I think it goes to the heart of our democracy. Um, if you don't have um, a strong uh, local accountability journalism and regional accountability journalism, um, you don't have a democracy because how does a voter make an informed decision uh, about who to vote for and what to think about, how to, whether to vote for a bond issue if you don't have the basic facts and enough about the basic facts to, to, to cast uh, the, the kind of vote that you need. Um, we, as a democracy, I think, face a very serious uh, threat here. You know, I am not only on the, uh, as a leader of ProPublica, I'm on the board of my local uh, weekly here in Montclair, New Jersey, the Montclair Local. Um, if any of you are listening from New Jersey and uh, haven't uh, signed up yet to our nonprofit, please do. We need your money. Back in the day, um, the way things worked here in Montclair, New Jersey, was that the local merchants, merchants charged a few pennies extra on every purchase, and they sent those pennies to the newspaper and bought advertising, and that advertising bought reporting, which gave us democracy. Um, today, we're trying to persuade those same customers to give us dollars, not pennies, every year um, to keep the newspaper alive. That, so far, is proving to be a tough sell. Um, what we've been doing at ProPublica is a sort of combination of things. Uh, we have created in uh, Illinois and uh, Texas uh, freestanding investigative units uh, comparable to what Judy was referring to. Judy and I were among the founding members of the New York Times investigative unit, which, which is a small group of people within the New York Times who focus solely on investigative reporting. Um, we now do that at ProPublica on a statewide basis. Can that substitute um, for what uh, Peggy, uh, Penny so well described as news deserts? Absolutely not. Um, the way uh, you get the sort of accountability journalism that democracy needs is by having reporters on the ground uh, in, in every town and city uh, in your state and, and in your region, and that is disappearing. And because of that, um, we are not necessarily seeing um, the kind of accountability journalism. We just don't know what's happening. Uh, one of the uh, projects that we funded through a different program at ProPublica, what we call the Local Reporting Network, these are year-long grants um, to give uh, money to a newspaper to put a reporter on a one-year project. We pay the salary and benefits and provide um, additional editing help and other, other resources. Um, you had a paper 
that was operating in Indiana uh, and several miles from its headquarters was a town uh, where the police had basically become completely out of control. Um, and uh, the uh, local newspaper had died. Um, the police chief was a, a friend of the mayor and essentially they decided to stop disciplining cops and um, enormous amounts of, of terrible things. Some of them crimes occurred. Uh, and uh, this reporter uh, from not even the town, but from a neighboring town came to us and said, I'd like to do a one year project on this police department. Um, and the things we found were stunning. Uh, there were indictments, uh, the chief quit, et cetera, et cetera. But none of this would have happened had that reporter who was there in the first place have at least heard that bad things were happening in that city. Um, and so, you know, we are not the national sort of investigative reporting is not going to be the substitute for great local reporting. We can catalyze it. We can help it. We can spread it. Um, but until and unless we find a real economic solution to local news, um, I am afraid that much of America is going to be doomed to living in a place where they don't really know what's going on. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Nico, uh, you've looked at uh, business models, alternative business models to newspapers. You're familiar with social media that some say uh, can replace local newspapers because everybody knows everything because we're all online. Uh, tell me two things. One, is that premise accurate? Uh, can we rely on uh, Facebook, Google News, et cetera, et cetera? And two, uh, alternatively, could you describe some of the ways in which the absence of local newspapers impacts our, uh, impact our democracies, ways that people might not think of uh, the price, the actual price that we pay for not having a local newspaper in our democracy? Absolutely. I'm going to start with the second question first. Um, you know, there are, I'd say, three main impacts of uh, the death of local news on our democracy. Uh, you know, if you think about the core mission of journalism is holding power accountable, whether that's corporate power or government power or political power, uh, there's some growing evidence that in the absence of uh, local news, there's a real increase in corruption and abuse of power at the local level. Uh, a study uh, that's um, in part out of the University of Notre Dame showed that in two municipalities adjacent to each other, one without a newspaper, one with a newsroom, uh, the, the one without a newsroom on uh, average paid an additional five to nine basis points in their municipal bonds in part because of the market's expectation of corruption and that no one's paying attention, right? No one's minding the story. There's no accountability. And so one big issue is about the, the absence of accountability of power. Uh, a second big issue is around um, its impact on our politics, especially our national politics. A Pew study in 2015 showed there were 22 US states that used to send local correspondents to Washington, DC that no longer do. So that's uh, 44 US senators who in their seven years in Washington, DC will not bump into a local reporter in the hallway. That's uh, 22 US states where there will be no reporting uh, about how this the healthcare bill affects our hospital, how the education bill affects our schools, how the infrastructure bill affects our roads, um, and there's it just a, there's just a void there, as Penny's put it so eloquently. It's a desert, and that has real profound consequences on our democracy. The third real issue is in the absence of this local news. Uh, there's like an information void and it's being filled with pollution, uh, with information pollution, with misinformation, with hate speech, with a range of other things that are really toxic to our communities. Um, and that's if we start to talk about the role of social media, uh, you know, I, there's no way social media replaces local news. Accountability journalism, holding power accountable takes time, takes money, takes perseverance, takes actual expertise, and it, it creates real challenges uh, for individuals to do on their own. Individuals are easily intimidated. Even reporters at local papers are regularly intimidated and they have like a corporate infrastructure behind them. Um, 
So uh, while social media adds some color here or there around around local events and local news, you know, photos I post on Instagram of our local Fourth of July parade, that is that's a form of news, but that is not the core iron core of journalism. That is not accountability journalism. Accountability journalism is hard. It requires institutional protections. It takes time, effort, and money and it requires professionalism. I think one of the great myths perpetrated by social media is about professionalism. This is kind of deprofessionalized almost everything, whether that be drivers, right, Uber and Lyft, or whether that be journalists in the case of Facebook and Google. Uh, there, there's, no, there's no substitute for the uh, established institutional discipline, professional discipline of journalism. Uh, I want to go back to uh, this question that I asked you, and I'd like each of you to address it. And if you care to say anything about what you've just heard from your co-panelists, please jump in. But how did this happen? Is it the fault of social media changing the business model? Is there any way to retrieve the original business model? Because if not, uh, <laughs> if there's no way to put out a, a local newspaper and make it profitable, even a nonprofit model work. Uh, where are we? I mean, uh, how did this happen to us? Yeah. Well, we should start. With, I think we should start with you, Penny, because you've been a publisher. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, I saw a question in the chat about has, has, has there ever been a nonprofit model? Uh, what is the for-profit? I think what's important to understand about the for-profit model that collapsed is exactly what Stephen said. That was heavily reliant on advertising. So between 85 and 90 percent of the uh, revenue from most local newspapers came from local businesses uh, who paid for that advertising. And that occurred for about 200 years. So between 2000, 2010, we saw the collapse of the print advertising model and nothing has come in to uh, replace it on the digital side. Uh, in fact, in most communities that we go into, we find that oh, as much as 75% of the digital revenue is going to either a Facebook or a Google. What's more concerning is uh, for 12 years, in addition to studying the loss of news, I've been looking at uh, developing sustainable business models. And what I've come to conclude based on the numerous uh, uh, in, uh, organizations and communities we've worked with is that if you are in a community that has at least average to above average, either economic or uh, population growth and have a publisher who has the ability uh, the, the purview to uh, have a local mandate that allows him to respond to the community's needs and expectations, you have a good chance of establishing at least a sustainable for-profit, non-profit or some hybrid model. Where I'm most concerned is with economically struggling communities. We found that the profile of a community that's lost a newspaper or has a ghost newspaper uh, the poverty rates are much higher, uh, as high as 33% in a country where we're currently about, uh, have an average of about 12%. So there needs to be, I think, considerable um, uh, emphasis placed on how do we come up with a model, either temporary or long-term, and policies temporary or long-term, that provide the information to the communities that are economically struggling and need it most. The, the picture, Judy, is fairly grim in this sense. Um, there aren't a lot of places to look for the money. Um, you know, the on the digital side, um, you know, one thought originally was we're going to have digital advertising that will save the day. We'll trade, you know, print dollars, as they used to say, for digital dimes. And it was a tough choice, but OK, we can do that. You know, we'll just we'll just tighten our belts. It turned out to be digital, uh, you know, one one hundredth of a dime. And even, even worse, um, the reason it was going there was structural, which is to say the Googles and Facebooks can collect for you an audience that you want as an advertiser. You want someone who wants to buy a couch this weekend, we'll get you 100 people who looked up couches. Um, we, on the other side, we don't know our audience that well. We don't know what they're searching for. We don't have their personal information in journalism. And so we can't tailor the audience the way those guys can. So I believe personally, I think Penny would agree with this, 
Advertising is dead. It's over. We are never going to support the news from advertising again. Forget it. So now you have to sell the product. And the problem you then get there is an interesting one. Yes, in uh, more wealthy communities, I think it's possible. But even there, there is a problem. And the problem is your customer, your, your owners, in essence, the people who are now paying the bills are your readers. So can you be tough and investigative and maybe offend half the audience with a story? Um, will you want to do that if your readers, in essence, own you? And believe me, even the successful papers face a bit of this. I mean, if you look at the New York Times and the Washington Post, um, if they make a mistake, the, the readers uh, who are generally, uh, certainly at those papers, left of center, um, deem offensive, they rise up on Twitter, they start canceling things. And, you know, if we do see a Biden-Harris administration, I predict to you that the Times and Post will be very tough on them, um, but that might have an economic cost. And so I think this is a new world in which the readers, if, if it's going to work at all, are king. And how's that going to work? I would I just pick up on a couple of things there. Um, you know, I think that if to go back to the original question, Judy, the, the, uh, if we look at the history of what happened here, you know, newspapers started to face real economic challenges basically before the internet was was a substantial thing. Corporate consolidation, uh, publicly traded comp taking newspapers from family owned businesses to publicly traded companies, uh, the pressure that that then created for quarterly dividends, uh, you know, in some sense, greed began the decline of, of, of news of newspapers. And then when technology shows up and brings total efficiency to the advertising market, uh, newspapers were already weakened enough, fragile enough that they can't, uh, they're not prepared for it. Um, and to, you know, I, I don't like to blame for the most part, Google and Facebook, because uh, all they really did was bring efficiency to the pricing of advertising during the depression, right? The, the, the uh, the, the department store magnet Wanamaker said half of my advertising works. I don't I just don't know which half. Well, it turns out it's more like 0.0005% of your advertising works. And uh, you can buy just that little slice uh, through technology. There is, however, one t giant, one tech platform that I think has contributed significantly to the challenges, economic challenges of journalism, and that's Amazon. Uh, in 2015, 2014, 2015, I was the deputy publisher of the Los Angeles Times. I spoke to over 100 advertisers from our largest advertisers, CVS, Walmart, Target, to our largest local advertisers, which was a local chain, a shoe store chain, a local camera store chain. Every single one said their biggest concern and fear was Amazon. And competing with Amazon was the biggest challenge they faced. And that that puts it's really hard to overstate the pressure that has put on local retailers, uh, which which then combined with the the, the pricing uh, with Google and Facebook has really been a death knell for for the economic model of newspapers. I completely agree with my colleagues on this on this on this call that. Um, you know, the, we have we have lived through the age of peak peak advertising. That for 150 years, roughly, advertising funded almost all of the news we've got. The you know funded a whole lot of good stuff, uh, and that those days are gone and not returning. And we don't really have a viable model for what will replace them. I think it's interesting to think about public media. I mean, the most robust example being the BBC. Uh, public media in the U.S. is virtually non-existent. What we think of as public media is overwhelmingly funded by viewers, not by the government. But we're beginning to see some movement on that front. I'll note, especially in the case of uh, Michael's New Jersey, right, this the state government is interested in trying to see if they can help fund local journalism. Um, to what extent has, is, has I, I realize these are both recent phenomena, but uh, we have to, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe too soon, but to what extent has the pandemic accelerated these trends? I mean, one would think that if everybody's at home, maybe there's more of an interest in local news and local developments and perhaps even newspapers, though nobody would want to go out to buy one. And the, <laughs> sec the second phenomenon is the steady attack for the past four years 
uh, uh, without getting too political here, by the uh, White House on news as not being credible. In other words, just you know, read what you want and choose the first people you want to believe because your newspapers are all false and they're all put out by people who don't share your views. Uh, to what extent is the attack on the press undermined uh, further the economic base and, and confidence, public confidence in, in media? So I'd, I would throw out those two questions for you. And uh, whoever wants to start, uh, Nico, do you want to start and then or well, I'll start on the, on the pandemic? I mean, I think, you know, to the extent we still have local news in the United States, it's funded disproportionately by what the industry calls preprint or also known as coupons, right? The coupons you use with your local grocery store, your local retailers. And the pandemic has hit local retailers so hard, it's had a really dramatic impact on advertising revenue. Um, it's really, you know, for, for all of the decline we're talking about, advertise, print advertising revenue is still the primary lifeline for local news in the United States, um, which I think I've estimated is going to be about $12 billion in, in, in print ad revenue in, in uh, calendar year 2020. Um, so, you know, the that pandemic is definitely, what's that? Down from before say five years ago. Oh, it, it, it's been in double digit decline year over year for approximately five years, um, uh, double digit percentage. So I think um, I think the pandemic's impact on local businesses then has a really, a really terrible impact on, on local news because of their continued dependence uh, on that revenue. And, and I expect we'll see some pretty catastrophic stories emerge. I mean, traditionally newspapers you know, the shopping, the holiday shopping season Q4 is traditionally the strongest quarter for newspapers. I'm sure there's a lot of publications hanging on by a thread, hoping to have a strong Q4. And if you don't, I think Q1, Q2, you'll see more closures, bankruptcies, and, and as Penny says, ghosts. Let me pick up on what Nico just said. Um, uh, I think that what you saw post 2008 was kind of a lag. Uh, you saw many of the papers that had closed of the 2100 closed in the period between 2010 and 2013. Uh, and so we were already beginning to see an acceleration between 2018 and 2020 of the number of newspapers that were closing. Many of those were family owned newspapers that couldn't find buyers or of uh, the continued consolidation. Uh, we saw immediately uh, in the six weeks uh, after the shutdown that we lost uh, more than three dozen newspapers. And we lost, according to the New York Times tally, about 36,000 um, uh, people who were associated with newspapers. And that includes uh, a whole range of, um, of folks. Uh, the, the payroll protection has kind of stalled that. And back to what Nico said, I think we're going to begin to see it uh, depending on how the fourth quarter uh, it comes in for most newspapers in the first and second quarter coming up. Um, it's kind of ironic. The pandemic has made us realize how important local news is. Uh, and uh, according to Pew, uh, research done uh, not last year, I guess it was, uh, people that they responded had noticed that the percentage of local news or news that was important to them or their community had been uh, dropping. 50% of people noticed that. What was alarming about that was that 75% almost of the people they surveyed had no idea local newspapers or even uh, digital sites were having any sort of economic trouble. So I think that the, the silver lining, if there is on the pandemic, is it reminds uh, us as consumers of news, how important knowing what's happening on the ground is. The the irony is it has also uh, gotten um, set up newspapers that were just teetering on the brink uh, to really go under in uh, in a pretty significant way uh, if nothing turns around really quickly. Yeah, where where we were sitting at the little Montclair local, because I actually now see the books, um, you know, without the PPP, um, we would have probably folded. Um, that uh, insulated us. It got us from like uh, what Nico called Q2 to Q3. Um, but the uh, drop in advertising, Judy, has been just absolutely devastating. Um, businesses are boarded up here. Um, those that are open are open for fewer hours. Um, they're not advertising. Um, and so advertising is way down. 
Um, and then you have a community. Uh, some people have lost their jobs. So even the people you might uh, collect subscriptions from, or in our case, memberships from, um, are, are thinking about what they can do without. Um, so I think, you know, as we go into next year, unless there's a, a drastic turnaround in the economy pretty quickly, I, I think it's going to be really brutal for uh, newspapers and news organizations of all sizes and shapes. Um, you know, so that is that that is a significant thing. Also, you know, I, I, just to back up on 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 on, the, on your question about sort of credibility, um, I do think this unrelenting, um, endless sort of attack on the news business uh, has had some effects. Um, you know, how you measure them, I don't know, but I mean, you know, on any given day, um, we can turn up somewhere now and want to talk to people who witnessed whatever a, a murder, an event. And some of them will just say, oh, you're just fake news. I don't want to talk to you. And that's, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty brisk. I mean, that's like, you know, at hello. I had you at hello. I mean, you know, we haven't even asked a question yet and we're fake news. Um, and so I think that's, that's problematical. And, um, you know, so much of your career, Judy, it was built on, you know, going to people that um, wouldn't necessarily agree with you, wouldn't necessarily like you, and, 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 and winning them over by saying, I want to get this right, I want to get this accurate, I want to be fair, and people would say, well, okay then. That is happening less. Uh, do, uh, Google just, I, I think, uh, said it was going to give a billion dollars to uh, newspapers and the press, the media. Um, is that a, just a drop in the bucket? I mean, is this, this is a pretty grim prognosis that you three seem to agree on. Uh, is there any uh, silver lining on the horizon? Can, can social media, I know we're going to address uh, how to resolve if there is a resolution or a solution to this crisis in our next hour, but uh, what about social media? And you talk about, uh, Nico, you mentioned that they, uh, that the role of social media, the Googles, uh, Facebooks was to ad, uh, to allocate advertising dollars more efficiently, but they also, uh, I'm going to be crude here, st steal content. I mean, the, when ProPublica puts out an investigative piece uh, or a newspaper in Montclair, or anywhere in the country, they can take it, they can snip, do a snippet of it, they can steal it all outright. Uh, does a billion dollars in uh, contribution at the church pew really substitute for a financial model? And uh, haven't they really been responsible in part for uh, not really stepping up to pay for the journalists who create the news, especially at the local level, that uh, local communities depend upon? Well, uh, I would say, uh, you know, <laughs> where to begin on this one? I mean, first, first some context, right, that at its height, uh, right before the, you know, at its height in roughly the year 2000, 2001, uh, local newspaper revenue was in the neighborhood of $60 billion. So $1 billion is not, you know, not that much in the scheme of things. Um, moreover, uh, I think that like a few, I guess two or three years ago, the Google News Initiative announced $330 million for, uh, to support the news industry in the United States. But when you really dug down in that money, a lot of it was already in their budget as marketing dollars. Um, and uh, I did most of it, almost none of it actually went to support news in any direct way. Much of it went to support efforts that might in various ways uh, assist Google, burnish Google's brand or help Google um, uh, grow their revenue. So I'm, I'm skeptical about the billion dollars and, and it depends a lot on how it's spent and, and how it's allocated. You know, there is a model for this in Europe, right? The European newsrooms kind of gathered together and went after Google and have a different model, a, a fund that, that for years now has forced Google to directly help subsidize local news in a significant way. This is very much what, uh, you know, I know uh, 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 Fox Corporation and, and Murdoch have been have been talking about that just like the, in the cable uh, ecosystem, cable news, uh, um, you know, or sorry, cable companies like Verizon and Comcast pay a carriage fee to the news channels. 
that Facebook and Google should effectively pay a carriage fee to um, to 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 the news organizations because of their use of that content. Um, you know, my own view is that in the last couple of years, Google has definitely uh, tried to be more helpful to newsrooms, but um, for the most part, it's too little, too late. We had over a decade where Google uh, was pretty aggressive with newsrooms about um, so-called first click free, which is really, really some Google Google's rules were punitive for newsrooms that were trying to convert frequent readers to subscribers to paid subscribers. So I'm um, color me quite skeptical about the role these uh, digital platforms are going to play in the overall ecosystem here. You know, I think a big, a big question, a big question is if news disappears completely, is that bad for Google's product? Is that bad for Facebook's product? The answer is not clear to me. Judy, can I pick up on that? Uh, we, had, we had the ability to analyze about 340,000 uh, 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 items that were posted on Facebook's local news feed uh, back last year. We focused in specifically on what was going on in North Carolina in the latest report. And what we found is that when an algorithm drives your news, you're dependent on what news is out there. And I think it was very um, significant that what we found, in, at least in North Carolina, of looking at what happened and comparing it to what made uh, the, the front page of local newspapers or were investigative pieces done by digital sites, is that they were putting out diminished as they were, we're still putting out that kind of critical news and information. But if we looked at what was going on the Facebook local news feed, more than half of that related to kind of crazy crime stories, one-off crime stories, and the other half related to kind of wacky human interest stories, many of which were not even in the community they were supposedly going to. And I think that speaks to that loss of, of news from um, th that is that you know we're already seeing as Nico points out. I think the second thing to think about is we have a a kind of an, a pyramid where the bottom base is where the news has uh, evaporated the most. That's on the local, the small um, local um, it, um, newspapers and digital sites that serve uh, small and mid-sized communities. Next up are the regional ones. Uh, so if you look down here, it's about 5,500. Up here, it's about 150. And then at the very top are the national news organizations. Each depend on feeding back up through the, the ecosystem. So the real critical question is, where do you spend the billion dollars even uh, to best support and shore up the news organization? Is it at that middle state and regional level? Is it down at the lower level? Steve, what's your view of that? Well... Uh, I don't know who's watching this, and, and I may be jumping a little bit of a gun here, but we're going to announce at ProPublica either today in a few minutes or in a few hours uh, a significant expansion of our local efforts. So we do have a viewpoint on the Penny's question, which is that I think you do have to at least begin by putting some more regional things in place. Um, so we're going to take our operation in uh, the Midwest, which has been called ProPublica Illinois, and turn it into ProPublica Midwest. We're going to double the number of reporters there. We're going to create a ProPublica South, which will attempt to do investigative reporting in the South and a ProPublica Southwest, although all these things will be just part of our organization. Um, and these will be fully funded standalone um, operations that will have reporters and editors who will focus on those regions. It will not, again, as I said earlier in this conversation, replace uh, the great local or regional newspapers in those places, but it may be able to um, put a few fingers in the dike, shall we say, to mix our desert metaphor here. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the, and why are we doing this? Because interestingly, what we have found, um, oh, it says we got announced we started the session. Excellent, thank you, Nico. I was looking at my phone and refreshing, and my, 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 our damn app doesn't refresh properly, so I couldn't see it. Um, so the, the idea is uh, that, uh, we all have technical problems, the idea of this is yeah. that you um, can now, to some extent, raise money at the national level to address the local crisis. And it's actually easier to do that, and we have done in this case, to fund this initiative than it is to go into individual towns and cities and persuade uh, people to give hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to support local news. 
there is a sort of growing group of people, thanks to, frankly, uh, Penny's work and Nico's thoughts and some other people who have brought this to sort of the attention of major foundations, there is a sort of larger uh, sense among the larger funders of, of democracy initiatives, if you will, that this is a problem and we got to do something about it. And it's got to be put in place, you know, and not be at the mercy of, you know, uh, small donations. So, yeah, I mean, I do think, Penny, that middle level uh, is, is for a, what we see at ProPublica is the next step um, to try to bolster that. And I hope to see ultimately out of this a national network of regional uh, things that we do that have permanent employees, permanent editors, and, you know, are not subject to the vagaries of, of, of this week's advertising. Mm -hmm. That's um, the hope. That's, when, when are you going to, uh, when are you going to start this, Steve? Just uh, it, will, it will come on, come on board in uh, January, 2021, we hope. I mean, we're out looking for editors right now. So if there are any journalists listening, um, there will soon be editing jobs posted. And the, the editor, of course, is a, is a key, component of one of these things. And we will hire reporters uh, shortly after finding the editors. And um, there is a whole, one of the things that we have learned is that in order to make this work in the modern era, you need a whole bunch of support behind that. So there will be people will be hiring to do social media and digital production and so on and so forth. So it isn't just the reporters, but clearly adding more reporters to any of these places who want to do this work and will have the support to do it um, should be helpful. One of, one of the amazing uh, impacts that we've seen from uh, lately is the explosion of conspiracy theory. Now, you know, it's not just QAnon. It's like there are a bevy out there. All you have to do is go on any website or, you know, Google, Twitter, any, anything, and you'll, you'll find them. Has the absence of local and regional uh, reliable uh, investigative news and newspapers contributed to this phenomenon, or is it causing it, or is it a reflection of it, um, and does it trouble you as journalists? Has it always been with us in America, kind of you know, crazy, crazy Aunt Bini theories about the universe, or is it just seem, does it seem larger today because of social media? And the you know the, the fact that a, a QAnon can kind of a QAnon uh, pedophilia ring run out of a pizza parlor can go viral. What what's what's the impact there? What's responsible for for which? Um, Nico, I want to take that. Well, I mean, I um, uh, America's always been nuts. <laughs> uh, you know, one of my favorite books is by H.G. Wells called Tono Bungay. It was written in 1910. It is as relevant today as ever. It's about a snake oil salesman and it's kind of about greed and spectacle and, you know, Americans longing for simple explanations and silver bullets. I think the big difference is that, and I also recommend, uh, uh, Kurt Anderson's fantasy, fantasy Land, which is kind of a history of conspiracy thinking in the United States, um, which goes back to my beloved Cotton Mather here in New England. Uh, but uh, but I think the big difference is that on social media, you know, it kind of uh, you can drown out the truth. This is where I'm kind of with Tim Wu that the First Amendment is just obsolete. The idea that speech is precious, so you have to protect it, it's no longer precious. And in fact, the truth gets drowned out and buried and lost in the vast ocean of toxic crap that fills the internet and, um, and, and, and really encourage us towards our worst instincts. You know, in my view, increasingly, the, the, the technology needs to be treated as uh, how we might treat a fun but potentially toxic drug like alcohol or tobacco or a virus <laughs> uh but viruses are never fun right <laughs> and who would have a good martini at the end of the day uh, penny, penny or steve you have a few. could could local news did the existence of local newspapers combat the kind of tendency pension towards conspiracy mongering in america I think there's a lot of research out there right now trying to prove that empirically. I think there is a, a general consensus that it has uh, uh, look, gone that way. I think that, uh, and that's shown, I think, 
in the recent polls that Gallup and Knight did where they track the diminishment of trust uh, in uh, both national media and local media. It's still higher in local media than it is in national media, but it's going down. And I think that's really a, a conflation of uh, uh, media and news. It's unfortunate that we say, do you have trust in media? And that gets linked in I, with, with uh, national organizations that also do entertainment. And I think that that is part of the problem on social media. It's as much entertainment often as it is news. And so we've lost that kind of uh, gatekeeper, that standard bearer that we had in the past that said, this is important. You need to look at it, Steve. Yeah, I, I agree. Two things. Um, I think it's it's amazing when you think about it that the internet has ushered this in because the internet has also ushered in a moment when investigative reporting or news reporting of any kind has a greater ability to show the receipts and the proof behind a story than we've ever had. I mean, Judy, when you and I wrote, you know, stories back in the day, we said things and, you know, you kind of had to take our word for it. But in modern uh, American journalism now, we can put up videos, photos, audio, documents, you know, the calculations behind everything we've done. So we have a greater ability to be persuasive today than ever, and yet we seem less persuasive. So that that's the thing. The other thing is I want to challenge Nico a little bit. I'm a free speech guy. Um, good Lord, Nico, what are we going to do if we limit speech? I mean, I, you know, I, I'd like to hear a little bit just, about your thinking. The truth gets drowned out every day on Facebook. And I mean, we're living in a world where QAnon is 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 much more the 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 narrative America consumes than anything that comes out of any newsroom, and you know I think that's really toxic and a problem for democracy. It's a program. It's a it's a problem that's metastasizing, and I, I'm not a I don't I believe in free speech. I just think that the current remedies, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Are, are totally inadequate to the moment we're living in. Which does open up a very difficult question, I think, which is that, you know, then we say, okay, don't use the word censor. So Mark Zuckerberg is America's editor. Um, I don't like that very much. I mean, we there's lots of potentially interesting solutions. I mean, maybe we need tougher libel laws. You know, that, that might go a long way towards, towards getting people to think a little more carefully about what they post online. I don't think that we have to frame this up in, you know, in any, in, I basically think the traditional arguments in view of free speech is just irrelevant. It's not bad. It's just absolutely irrelevant in the current moment. Um, You're giving me a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and the other, the other problem, of course, is that we could eliminate, change a communications law to eliminate the provision which insulated uh, Facebook, Google uh, from uh, liability uh, for for libel, a slander, and other untrue <laughs> statements that publishers had to contend with daily. I mean, the fact of the matter is, to help these companies uh, when they were starting out, Congress did not create a, le a, a level playing field. But newspapers and newspaper editors have to are held to a different standard than Mark Zuckerberg. And I, uh, I think uh, there is my own sense, but I would welcome your closing thoughts on this because we have to move soon to our next panel. Uh, but do you think Congress in, is in a position to do something to help level the playing field, to make the Googles of the world uh, more uh, responsible to the content providers whose material they take and post without adequate remuneration uh, has it can it, are there legislative remedies that would work and uh, do you see it happening uh who, who, penny would you like to start and then yeah, sure. All right, well i think one of the issues is we're we're dealing with policies and legislation for the most part that was relevant to the 20th century uh it takes a uh, rethinking of the policies that are out there and a rethinking of what the unintended consequences are so it's it's real easy to say we should have a tax on um, google and facebook where they have to do it exactly like it is in uh europe or in or it will be soon in australia but who gets the money how do you define a news organization it's going to require a real rethinking around a whole uh, uh, 
range of things. And I think what we're really faced with is, are we going to look at short term solutions, which we need some short term solutions? And how do we get from the short term solutions to the bigger holistic uh, considerations that we need to uh, consider in the 20th, uh, 21st century? Steve? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think we, we definitely need both. Um, I am very distrustful of ever um, allowing the government to fund journalism. I think our government cannot be trusted to keep its hands off the content. Um, so I, I'm not in favor of something. This is how I'm just, one of the questions that popped up in the chat here was, is this a global problem? Absolutely, yes. It's happening all over the world. And some of the other solutions have been, let's have the government fund journalism. Um, th that might work in Norway. Um, I, I don't think it'll ever work here. Um, and I agree with Penny that um, on the one hand, yes, um, it's tempting to go where the money is, which is clearly Google and Facebook. Um, but you know, be careful what you wish for. Um, you know, I, I keep dreaming of the possibility that we can get people to pay for a very good product, which is which is local news. I think local news delivers an awful lot, um, but we have been singularly unable to do that at the moment. And so we, we we need solutions otherwise. Although I will say, I want to say one more time, Nico, opening up the libel laws, is, 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 is a, as a president I know once said, is one, something that makes me nervous. So I'll stay away from that <laughs> solution. Uh, I mean, I think there's, there's a range of potential solutions. And what we need is a robust discussion and some more creative thinking about how to deal with an information landscape that's totally transformed, that is not is completely different from the information landscape of the last thousand years, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the, one, the one thing I would say is that um, I don't, um, you know, I, I, I'm very confident that, you know, Penny opened this way and I'm 100% I'm with her. I'm very confident there are lots of communities in the United States that can afford local news and will, will figure out how to have robust local news. The problem is that it, it could be, it looks to me like it's going to be a luxury product. And what does that do in these in, in our communities? What does that say for everything from corruption and polarization? It's not healthy for the democracy to have news as a luxury product, to have accountability as a luxury product. Well, um, this has been truly enlightening, if depressing. <laughs> and uh, I can't thank each of you enough for spending the time and uh, debating this topic and helping us understand the depth and breadth of the challenge we face. And I think the irony of all this is uh, never uh, has the Republic been so dependent on an educated uh, electorate yeah. and uh, never have the economic and social and political challenges to the providers of information to the electorate been as, as great as they are today. So I want to thank you all for doing what you do every day. And I, I've admired you for a long time. And thank you for participating. And thank you if you're out there watching, listening, and uh, those of you who want a job in journalism, contact Steve. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Michael Hendricks and hope you'll join us for a second hour to explore solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy, and thank you to all of our panelists. That was an excellent and challenging discussion. And I really can't say enough how much we should all value and respect the work of each of our panelists here. It's just incredible work. Um, and now as we get ready for our next panel to speak, I, it's important to recognize that there are a number of promising experiments underway to fill this news void, just as we've already heard. Uh, this next panel will consider many of the solutions or at least experiments and changes um, meant to address the ongoing consolidation and contraction of local journalism. Uh, we'll, we'll ask, among many other questions, what can be done to revive local journalism? And what are innovative news organizations doing to sustain this local coverage and investigative reporting? So to help answer these questions and uh, drive the conversation forward, I'm delighted to introduce the moderator of our next panel, Howard Husak. Uh, Howard is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, where he served as vice president for research and publications from 2006 to 2019, and is a contributing editor at City Journal. He also directs the Institute's Tocqueville Project, which uh, puts on our annual Civil Society Awards and our Civil Society Fellows Program. I think it's also important to note that Howard's a former 
broadcast journalist and uh, I believe print journalist as well and a documentary filmmaker. Uh, he was at uh, WGBH Boston where his work won three Emmy Awards. He's also a past board member of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I really could not think of a better person to lead this discussion. So with that, over to you, Howard. Thank you so much, Michael, and thanks to our first panel uh, for setting the stage for what we hope will be a, a discussion of possible approaches to addressing the news desert problem. I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel members. Uh, Gordon Krovitz is the co-founder. There you are. Hello, is, Howard. Is the co-founder of NewsGuard which rates the reliability of news and information websites, ties into a lot of what the first panel was just talking about. Gordon has a long and distinguished career in all aspects of journalism, including as publisher, editorial board member, and columnist for the Wall Street Journal, where he also wrote a regular column entitled Information Age. That's the one we're living in. Uh, he, he is a graduate of the University of Chicago and the Yale Law School. Frederick Rutberg, is the publisher of the Berkshire Eagle in Western Massachusetts, as well as of three Vermont newspapers, also owned by New England Newspapers, Inc., the Bennington Banner, the Manchester Journal, and the newspaper with the best name in America, the Brattleboro Reformer. He's a former district court judge in Berkshire County, Massachusetts. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan and the New York University School of Law. And Laura Walker, president of Bennington College. She's here because she was the founding president of New York Public Radio and held that position for 23 years. Under her leadership, we were talking about the downturn in local news. Well, under her leadership, New York Public Radio and its flagship station, WNYC, increased, that's plus, its monthly audience from 1 million to 26 million making it the most listened to news and information outlet in New York City. On her watch, its budget increased from eight to 95 million, while WNYC Studios became one of the top three podcast studios in the world with 32 million downloads per month. She really helped to invent podcasting. And I'm guessing now that she's a regular reader, I hope, of the Bennington Banner. Absolutely. Great <laughs> to hear. <laughs> I, I'd like to start with uh, Fred Rutberg. Uh, we heard in the first panel about how local newspapers uh, make democracy work. And uh, as a bridge from the first to the second panel, I want to ask you, is that just a lot of romantic nonsense? Or can you give us some examples of how you're doing that? Well, um, I'm a bit, as you, as you uh, tell from my uh, bio, I'm a bit of a novice in this business, a neophyte. But yes. Uh, when you ask that question, what comes to mind is uh, something that happened here in the Berkshires about a year ago. There was a dispute as to whether or not to rebuild or to fix up a, a regional high school in uh, the town of Dalton, which serves several towns. Some of them are small, some of them are large. And it became a, a really big public issue uh, because it was going to impact seriously on the tax rates of, of various towns and the smaller towns, the tax rates are, are quite, uh, we're going to be impacted quite severely. And we were, we wrote on it, we covered it, we, we told the story, but in doing so, we opened up a, a, a discussion among these various towns, the townspeople in these various communities, our letters to the editor were incredible. Uh, they came day after day, um, two, three, four at a time sometimes, uh, on both sides of the issue, well thought out. I mean, in this world of polarization where everyone seems to, uh, where snark seems to be the, uh, the the coin of the realm, these were letters that were intelligent and well and well thought out, but were very emotional and passionate, people talking about losing their homes or uh, wanting to send their children to good schools. And when I reviewed all those letters as they were coming in, I thought we're really doing our job because when we undertook to buy the newspapers, the thing that motivated me was um, to make re the Berkshire Eagle 
return it to its position as the town square. And I think that that's part of what uh, local journals can be. We are the town square, can be the town square in various communities. And clearly you can't have democracy uh, without an exchange of ideas. And the town square is a place for the exchange of ideas. Typically, now I'm going to go to my next panelist, but I'm going to stick with you for a minute, Fred, if, if Gordon and Laura won't mind, <clears throat> and ask you about the core subject of this panel, which is the business model. You're a local owner, so in that way, you, you contrast from some of what we heard discussed in the first panel about chains and hedge funds owning newspapers. But tell us about the financial picture. It's grim. Um, we... we to begin with, uh, myself and uh, three colleagues bought these newspapers from a hedge fund, uh, one of the ones you hear about, you read about. Um, and uh, the, the reason we bought the papers, uh, the motivating factor was to try to restore uh, some of the quality that had dissipated during the years of, of absentee ownership. Uh, our, our group of newspapers was owned by a, a family, as is usually the case. The Miller family owned these papers um, for about 100 years, and they built up, uh, you know, some, some quite extraordinary institutions. So, but in the meantime, um, you know, the hedge funds came in, and their, um, their financial plan is different. I mean, basically, uh, it's like a, a junkyard. They come in and s uh, sell off the scrap. Um, the business plan raises the price of the product to the uh, reader. They raise the price of subscriptions, um, and then they lower the quality by reducing the, uh, they don't intentionally lower the quality, but they intentionally lower the cost basis by uh, decimating the newsrooms, which has inevitable effect of lowering the quality. So we've tried to restore the quality of our newsrooms. We've invested heavily into it. Um, but advertising, as the previous panel was saying, uh, has been a tough, tough call. Uh, certainly post-COVID, we, we experienced the same kind of shocks that every other uh, media organization has as a result of COVID. We lost almost $2 million worth of advertising between the beginning of COVID and mid-March to the end of August. That's an enormous amount of money for a company of our size. Uh, but even as before we bought the papers, uh, in, in the Berkshires, we had a mall, the only mall and closed mall in the community. Um, and in the time that we started negotiating to buy the papers until today, we've Macy's is closed, uh, Penny's is closed, Sears is closed, Best Buy is closed. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of advertising disappeared, never to be, rep to be replaced. So the economics of journalism is very, very difficult. Um, I'm encouraged by the fact that we are looking to get a larger chunk of our revenues from uh, readers the, by way of um, subscription and, and uh, newsstand prices, as opposed to advertisers, because I think that is the sustainable uh, or way to do it down the road. But it's very scary because people are used to not paying very much for newspapers. Uh, you know, the New York Times got to be famous because it only charged a penny back in 1896. Um, that's a long way from a penny to three dollars. Um, and so we have, uh, and, and our readership is is older than normal, which is not again kind of normal, and uh, they're they're very price sensitive. So the challenges are extremely high, and everyone says that the value of our papers are that we report local news, and everyone wants local news, and that's the most expensive to produce because it takes boots on the ground. All right. Well, that, that's that's a terrific insight into how hard your job is. And I'm, I'm desperate to talk to Laura because she has such a success story. But if she'll bear with me and I talk to Gordon, who has been a publisher of a major newspaper and I know has been an investor in local newspapers around the country. We've heard, including from the first panel and now from Fred, can we get subscription money? That's a way of saying, is there a sustainable financial model for local news gathering? Well, I think having heard uh, the challenges that Fred uh, faces, these are common challenges to local publishers. I think there are reasons to be optimistic. For me, the number one reason is the one that Fred already mentioned, which is that 
the combination of advertising going to Facebook and Google, to the difficulties in local communities as retailers become a smaller and smaller opportunity for advertising, that has pushed local publishers, as Fred just said, really to focus on reader revenues rather than the historic backing of advertising revenues. If you turn the clock back 30 years for a local newspaper and for many national newspapers, 80% of the revenue was from advertising, 20% from readers. Actually, the reader cost was so low that it was essentially subsidizing the advertising. In other words, the product that was being sold were the subscribers to the advertisers. We're now in a different world where news publishers understand that advertising is never going to come back to the level it was. It was not going to disappear altogether, but it's not going to be the support that it was. And the question now is, what can journalism do to create enough value to be able to generate significant reader revenues? That's a problem that the national brands, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, a few others, have had more time to try to address. They have easier challenges, I think, than local publishers have. They have brands that have value beyond their communities. They're larger. They have more scale. So I think the most difficult problem in journalism is the one that Fred faces, which is local journalism. There are experiments. There are, is a real focus now on reader revenues. I think local publishers are literally a generation behind in focusing on reader revenues compared to the big national brands. And I hope it doesn't take that long to catch up. I don't think it will. Um, but I remain optimistic that with enough experiments and enough focus and smart people trying to solve this problem, um, that while local journalism is not going to be the high margin business, perhaps, that it once was, that we can at least find business models that will sustain good-sized newsrooms, and great journalism. I would say one other thing, which is that as publishers focus on reader revenues, much of that focus is on digital. The number of people who are print subscribers is in decline. And that actually is great news for publishers because the profitability of a digital subscriber is much higher than that of a print subscriber. We can come back to this topic, Howard, if you like, but I think there's some real economic- that in, in our solutions box on my whiteboard, which is not here. Uh, and, and I wanna to turn to a success story in the category of listeners supporting local news. And uh, Laura Walker, uh, Tell me about how you were able to get so many people to pay for local news. Uh, we can't hear you, Laura. You have to unmute Here yourself. We go. Howard, it's great to see you. And Fred, I am a, a loyal subscriber and reader of the Bennington Banner, which I think is one of the really uh, best kind of local newspapers in the country. Um, and so uh, we were able to increase our local news coverage um, uh, by uh, probably tenfold while I was there in terms of the kind of output we had and the and the amount of money that we were uh, putting behind it. Uh, the public radio model um, is, I think, a quite extraordinary one that uh, I, at least about five years ago, I felt like all the newspapers were trying to copy the public radio model without really understanding it. And I think um, one of, there's several things that uh, allowed us to invest in local news. And it wasn't so much that local news was profitable from the point of view of uh, really, you know, people uh, only supporting WNYC because it's local. They supported WNYC and we grew uh, the, the membership, I think it was about 50,000 members to about 350,000 members uh, for our all of our properties. Um, we did that because we offered a combination of uh, national news. We did really strong investigative news that that really popped out and people, uh, I think listeners understood um, 
the value of an investigative report, for example, that uh, broke the news around stop and frisk or stories of teenagers in New York City uh, who are struggling with with problems of uh, addiction and uh, homelessness, you know, that that really get um, branded and and stick out, you know, in a way. We were able to, because of the platform of radio, to be able to build a real community feeling uh, so that, uh, and a large enough audience so that when Brian Lehrer would say, um, could I hear from people who live in the, you know, the public housing projects on 125th Street, the phones would light up. And then can I hear from people who live downtown, you know, in the East Village, the phones would light up. Um, and really to have a kind of a community conversation that mattered. The, the, as you know, Howard, from your time at CPB, the business model of public radio is about, and we were about at New York Public Radio, a third, a third, a third. As we, were, as we grew from 8 million to 95 million, we pretty much stayed almost all the time as a third membership, a third kind of foundations and government, and a third uh, of corporate sponsorship. And it is the fact that we have multiple rev revenue streams that are pretty um, sustainable and strong uh, that I think uh, allowed us to, to grow. We also, frankly, funded the local newsroom with, you know, uh, surplus from other other kind of sources. So we were able to, you know, when I left, we had about 75 people in the local newsroom and we were the largest, uh, you know, the most listened to radio station in New York City. And that was both because we had morning edition and, and national news, but largely because we had built up a local news presence. But I would say that I think that um, people, who are members support the whole, they support the whole platform. So having local national podcasts, other kinds of things really helps to, uh, to kind of make the case to listeners that they should be supporting. You know, I look at the, at the WNYC website, I look at the New York Times website, and sometimes I can't tell the difference, right? Because audio, video, and text all run together now. Yeah. Can this new media world that we live in just make even terms like newspaper point? Is it possible that media can merge all of these things and all these platforms can come together and we shouldn't be thinking about reviving quote unquote newspapers? I 100% I agree with you, Howard. I think that uh, we all get stuck in our own little um, media bubbles and the the I think the radio stations that are most successful are those that uh, purchased like uh, we did um, Gothamist and LAist and SFist so those that are both digital and radio and understand that they're two different kind of mediums and you speak to and raise money in slightly different ways but you also can repurpose things a lot and i think everyone has, as you, you said it very well i think everyone has to be video audio print and digital and the more we can do that in local news i think the stronger we will be and i i think that uh will also, uh, I, I think the other thing that public radio has that I think um, that, that newspapers and others can have as they move into this multi-platform world is to see themselves as a cause in a way. You're, you're, um, you're, and people I think will give more money to something that they believe is really serving the community and serving the community in a variety of different ways. When we could get $110 a year from the average, from you know listeners who uh, you know did they were paying for something they got for free. They didn't have to do this. It's because they believed in the cause and they believed in the fact that you know that we need uh, in this world and in this uh, city, you know, we need journalism that is truthful and that brings communities together, that unifies and has civic debate. And, and I think people really want that. And if you appeal to that part of them, even if you're a for-profit, I, I mean, I think the New York Times does this. You listen to the, to the kind of, you know, um, pieces they do for subscribership on the daily, it sounds just like a public radio pledge drive, um, you know? And so I think that everyone can be, can be, uh, 
because there's you're serving a mission as well as uh, the local journalism uh, cause. Well, of course, public radio is a nonprofit, has nonprofit status. So I want to go to Gordon and Fred and ask a question. We know the Philadelphia Inquirer is a nonprofit foundation supported entity right now. There's talk about nonprofit status being a, a, uh, a vehicle to save local journalism. I'll, I'll start with Gordon, but I want to ask the same question to Fred. Is, is that a, a uh, will of the wisp or is it an important possibility? Well, uh, Howard, I have two answers for that. <clears throat> on the one hand, one of the newspapers that I helped to fund, uh, one of the news sites, forgive me, I helped to fund is called Denverite, based in Denver, Colorado. And when you say help to fund, it means you invested personally. I did. And it was eventually acquired uh, by Colorado Public Radio for many of the reasons that Laura outlined. It had an intimate tone, which I think resonated with public radio. It had a different kind of relationship with its community than legacy newspapers typically do. It wasn't partisan or anything like that, but it was deeply committed to the community and was often looking for solutions to problems in the community. A different kind of voice as well than a legacy newspaper typically would have. And that, of course, has become a nonprofit, although it is a, I hope, significant support for the memberships at Colorado Public Radio. And so it's a revenue driver, whether it's for profit or not for profit, I don't think it matters that much. It's still a revenue driver. And as Laura said, public radio was the pioneer in serving members and generating memberships. And even more than typical news sites, because when you think of typical news sites, they allow a certain number of accesses to that site every month. Then you have to pay the metered model, five articles, and you have to pay. Public radio is not like that. You get everything for free. You don't really have to pay. So they truly pioneered the idea of addressing members, communicating the value, and creating a community around their brand. So I'm very optimistic about the role of public radio in continuing to fund local news. Having said all of that, I desperately hope that there are market solutions to local news that allow for profits also to thrive. I think it's critically important. I think public radio is an outlier in being able to generate you know, the revenues that it's been able you know, to generate. Not for profits still have to have income coming in. It might be off of a very large donation, but even the largest donations eventually expire. We have to find sustainable business models to support local news in whatever form that might be, whether it <clears throat> calls itself public radio or calls itself a website or calls itself a blog or calls itself a 150-year-old newspaper, the issue is the same, which is how can we find sustainable business models to allow those newsrooms to continue and to thrive? Well, I, I promised to ask you about nonprofit status narrowly, Fred, but let's, Gordon has just expanded this in a useful way. Nonprofit could be part of a sustainable business model, but let's talk about whether you discern a, a sustainable business model in what you're doing at the Berkshire Eagle and your other newspapers. Well, we're constantly building a, a business model that's sustainable. We have, you know, when we uh, announced we're going to buy these papers, we announced two separate goals that we wanted to do. Um, my late partner, someone you know, Bob Wilmers, said that he wanted to build the finest community newspaper in America. And my other colleague, Hans Morris, said he wanted to build a company that would last 100 years. And I say that without those two goals, it, it, the exercise is not worth doing because you can build a great newspaper, but if it disappears, what good is it? You can build a newspaper that lasts 100 years, but you can do it by uh, simply selling junk, and then what good is that? So we're trying to do two things, those two things simultaneously. Um, and we're constantly looking at um, refining and re, uh, re, uh, um, our new our business plan to take into account what's happening in the market uh, to make this a sustainable plan. And just with since COVID, uh, we undertook a ground up look at the company, uh, and we've made we've announced 
publicly that we're going to focus more on digitally than on digital than on print. But uh, the truth is, despite what Gordon said uh, and the shrinking advertising budgets, et cetera, it's still print that pays the bill. So it's a it's a really delicate it's a, a, a balance you have to walk on here. Um, so we see the value of philanthropy as a contributing stream of income to our long-term for-profit model. Well, how so? Where is philanthropy fit this in? I don't understand. Well, we've, we're, we're going to announce at some point a, a, a fund that's been already been created with our local community foundation to allow people to support um, quality journalism with their donations. That money will be earmarked to come to, to special projects here at the paper, or and I say the paper, I mean digital as well as, as print, um, thing uh, to, to, uh, to support uh, reporting on economic development, on uh, healthcare, arts and culture, um, and, uh, and things that support a nonprofit model. And so that those who are able to and, and are and uh, have the disposition to want to support a public radio could also do that for us as well. That would augment our uh, income stream. But we still want to sell advertising. We still want to sell papers or, or, or digital subscriptions because that's our um, independence. And um, it, uh, to me, that's very important. Well, let's pick up on that term independence. That's very interesting because when you rely on, uh, Laura, you talked about government and foundations. Now, I listen to public radio a lot and we hear the MacArthur Foundation for reporting on this. Well, as Gordon knows from having been deep in the Wall Street Journal, anytime you dictate what stories are selected, you are dictating a lot. Story selection is integral to the ultimate journalistic project. Should we be of good cheer about that sort of philanthropy? Should we be wary of it? Is there a way you have to keep it at arm's length? Yeah, I mean, I think that is a really good question. Um, you have to keep it at arm's length. And you also, it can, no funder should ever be involved at the level of, of story selection and certainly nothing to do with the story itself. We even very rarely had, um, it was only rarely that we had reporters talk to funders. We also said no to, to funders where we thought either the reality or the perception would be that they were influencing the coverage. So as an example, we said no to uh, Gates coverage of when they wanted to fund our reporting on education um, because we wanted to be, it wasn't, it, I wasn't that worried that they were going to actually tell us what to do about charter schools, but they had such an interest in certain schools in New York that, that uh, I was well, funding them, right? concerned that there would be a perception of, of control. Um, but I actually, I do worry more about individuals and um, foundations, uh, and it's, it's not even the story selection. It's because somebody comes to you with a large amount of money for a particular interest, even if they're not talking about the exact stories, it will give you, uh, it, it, it could um, sway you to cover that more you know, so than, than you normally would or that you think would be part of the right appetite, the, the right, you know, kind of diet of, of news. And so I think you have to be careful about that. And, and also, I mean, I think it's true with, people are very concerned about government support. As you know, Howard, CPB had real, you know, uh, uh, walls between the editorial and the, and the uh, funding. And um, I found certainly in my time that CPB was, you know, totally agnostic about what you covered, and, and corporations also, um, but foundations and individuals sometimes uh, you really had to be wary. Well, pivoting on the term philanthropy, apart from the foundation, the community foundation model, I'm a huge fan of community foundations, so that's very interesting. You're turning your newspaper into a cause, which is what Laura was suggesting so that's so interesting but we've also seen uh what i would call the colonel mccormick model of journalism re-emerge colonel mccormick used to own the chicago tribune mm -hmm. in the early 20th century golden age and he was the man 
you know, and even influenced how they spell words, everything. Uh, we now have uh, philanthropic or you might call Daddy Warbucks owners of the Los Angeles Times, indirectly the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, Gordon, is, is that a serious part of the mix? You know, Colonel, Colonel McCormick once told his correspondent in Mexico, if you'll just get that war started, I promise <laughs> well, you. You provide the story, I'll provide the war. Yeah. That's right. So, um, I, I, you know, I think that there are certainly wealthy individuals who, for a variety of complex reasons, have been willing to step up to become newspaper owners. There are some who grew up in the industry. Rupert Murdoch has, has been in the industry for a very, very long time. Uh, Jeff Bezos has not been in the industry for a very long time, but felt um, an obligation, I think is the way he's put it, to try to do something to support uh, the industry. I do go back to the fundamental question, however, of sustainability for local news. Um, people who end up owning news publishers occasionally um, find out that they're harder to run than they thought. Sometimes they lose more money than people thought they would. Sometimes there are social pressures that grate on people. As I think everybody on this panel knows, there are some pressures on publishers that there aren't on people who don't have that job. It's not for everybody. And for people who grew up in another industry, sometimes they find out they didn't know something about the job that sometimes they wish they had known. So Howard, if it's okay, I actually, under the auspices of the Manhattan Institute, wanted to make two quasi-legal arguments. And uh, Judge, you'll correct me if I say anything incorrect. Um, but I think the, the, the common law in the United States took two very significant missteps um, since the launch of the internet that people didn't see or understand or even maybe realize at the time what was happening. One of them has to do with the common law of fair use. So I think we all understand that as we thumb through our Facebook feeds or we look at a Google search result, there's a lot of value from seeing news articles. It might just be a thumbnail of a news article, but lots of times people will go to their social media outlet or uh, Google News or wherever they might be in order to catch up on the news and often there's no revenue at all to the news publisher for the value that a consumer has received on another platform. The common law of fair use really built up in the telegraph era and the early newspaper era um, and has not really kept up in that way with the realities of the way people now consume news on platforms like the digital platforms. There are reasons to be optimistic that if we went back to some different view of fair use, that the economics could be quite significant. Microsoft just coincidentally, I think yesterday, announced that over the past few years, by licensing news from news publishers for its MSN news aggregating site, had written checks for a billion dollars. Now that's worldwide, it includes a lot of publishers, but a billion dollars of revenue to license content where there's no incremental expense, very profitable revenue to publishers. Microsoft is certainly not the biggest consumer facing digital platform for news. Facebook, voluntary Google, Microsoft part. entirely voluntary on Microsoft's part. That's been their business model since the beginning of the internet to license the content. I believe Microsoft would say they wanted to present the news on their own platform in a way that served their users best. So they take the content in, it all looks kind of the same. It's super convenient for consumers. They're not sending people out back to the website the way a Facebook would or Google News would. Well, um, let, me, let me just jump in here before you get to point number two. So this is, this is a quite different little hand grenade you've thrown into our conversation, which is maybe we need to change the rules of the game in order to help preserve and sustain local journalism. Is this a legislative fix that you want to propose here? 
Well, I, I, I actually, I think it's more fundamental than that. I think it's a, it's a re-understanding, a return to the basic concepts of the common law. It could be <clears throat> enunciated through legislation. Fair use could be done through copyright legislation. Um, but the fundamental point is, if somebody is getting value for a significant part of somebody else's work, that other person has property rights in that work and should be compensated for its fair use by somebody else. And I think we just kind of lost track of the underlying principle. And given the way we all now consume news, it's quite a significant shift that we made, I think, without really focusing on how significant the shift was. So you've, you, Howard, you've let me talk, throw one hand grenade in, and I want to do another one before. Okay, real quick, Gordon. Okay, I'm going to move quickly. The other common, the, the other um, common law issue, of course, is the common law of torts, and and how in 1996, with excellent intent, Congress passed the Telecommunications Act, which included in Section 230 a safe harbor for the digital platforms that essentially uh, removed liability for libel and under slander, the common law of libel and slander. And that was done in order to let the internet grow and to see how it would evolve. The platforms, as the earlier panel indicated, uh, Mark Zuckerberg does not feel the same responsibility for what appears on his platform that the publisher of the New York Times uh, would feel about what's on the New York, on the New York Times. Um, I, I think that's had a deleterious impact on the cultures of the digital platforms. I think they were told not to take responsibility and they are succeeding. And I think there are efforts now, particularly in Europe with the European Commission, which has a code of practice on disinformation that uh, several platforms have signed up to comply with. They require them, for example, to give information about the trustworthy nature of the news that people see on their platforms. Um, Australia has similar legislation pending. The UK has legislation they describe as an online harms white paper, which would also create a new duty of care. And just about a week ago, and this did not get much publicity, but the Department of Justice issued its proposal for reforming Section 230, which included a new obligation of uh, on the part of the platforms to disclose their criteria for moderating content, to apply their uh, rules consistently, to have that obligation, to be able to prove that. And I think quite significantly, an obligation to engage with publishers when their content is being moderated. That's a radically different way of operating. That's actually what NewsGuard does. We pay particularly attention to the, that proposal for Section 230. But I think in those two areas of, of unintended reversal of centuries of common law around fair use, number one, and around uh, tort law, number two, we've unintentionally tilted the economics of news in a way that's quite destructive of the news industry. So I'm gonna just underscore the phrase reform of section 230 and urge our viewers to be on the lookout for that in public discussion, uh, because it sounds like it's a very big deal. Uh, underlying this discussion, of course, is the presumption that people really do want local news. At the same time, we've heard on the first panel that when Facebook posts what it considers to be local news, sometimes it's local human interest stories or crime stories, I, I want to ask both Laura and Fred, starting with Laura, whether you're convinced there is such a market. How do you know that? So for instance, Laura, if you tried to raise money around stories about public housing projects in New York compared to raising money around very popular talk shows, were they each similarly effective? I'm sorry there. I think it's a really good question about whether people really want local news and what they what what they really think local news is, you know. So, uh I 
think in terms of raising money, we were, our um, approach was to kind of uh, raise money for both at the same time, because some people really want to give to the talk show or to the community feeling. Um, but most people want also to know that uh, they are supporting really good, truthful, truthful news. And so I, I do really believe that um, both from the point of view of uh, people, uh, the, the reader, the listener, um, finding out about their community, people want that. But the other thing you really have to do is, is present it in a way that is uh, going to appeal to them and is going to be on the uh, on the platforms that they're they're using. So uh, looking at maps and data data uh, kind of journalism is a really strong way of getting people involved. Just to go back to the example I said before, when we broke a lot of the stop and frisk, we did maps of New York and where the, you know, we kind of layered census data and, you know, stop and frisk data and uh, precinct data on top of each other and showed people where you know, what was going on. And it turned out that in certain precincts, there was a lot more, uh, you know, stop and frisk activity than in others. And it didn't really have much to do with the census, uh, you know, the makeup, demographic makeup of the of the community. Um, but people could l look at it and, and, and like it. And so local news is as much, you know, what is the hurricane coming? And can I look at that to, I think a mix of, really serious news and things like, you know, KPCC, uh, you know, features kind of like the unheard stories of, of LA or what to do in real life as well as virtually this weekend. And I think you need to do it all, honestly. Uh, and, um, but I do, I, I think people for the most part really want to hear about uh, their local communities. Fred, let me, uh, change the question just slightly, and I'm building on an audience question in this in this regard. Do reporters want to report local news? Do you know? I, I started off as a reporter for the Middletown New York Times Herald Record in Middletown New York, the Newsday of the North. It's still being published. Uh, uh, was owned by the Ottawa Newspapers, later bought by the Wall Street Journal, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I I had to call the state police every two hours and say, any accidents? And try to turn those into stories. Do journalists want to do that? Or are they so reform-minded and wanting to advance uh, their ideas of that they want to advocate that it's hard to get them to do that kind of grunt work that sometimes leads to big stories? Well, um, I don't I have not experienced what you just suggested. The, we've had no problem recruiting some excellent new reporters to our paper. We just added someone last week. I can't mention her name because it's not public yet. Um, and a, a young person who uh, is going to come from public radio um, and um, is eager, eager to, to come out and report local stories. Um, and uh, our I've, I've not experienced any pushback from any of our reporters about covering the local stuff. They, that's what they're here for. That's their job. I'm sure every, like any other job, if you covered, you know, 18 fires, the 19th fire gets kind of boring. Um, and that may be taken that way. And so, and again, with, with, it's possible with reporters that they've been around long enough that uh, they, they can get a little set in their ways and, and perhaps a little lazy, but that, that's, I, I don't see any problem getting reporters to uh, go out and cover the news. I think they're quite eager to do it. Um, and as far as the value of local news is concerned, um, Howard, you know, it was proven to us with COVID. I mean, our, our circulation spiked up uh, with COVID because people want to know what's going on. And they don't, they, they don't, they don't read the Berkshire Eagle or the Bennington Banner uh, to see how many people died in America. They want to know what's happening in their local hospitals. They want to know what's going on here because they, when, when COVID hit, it became really crucial to know what was happening locally. You wanted to know what was safe, what wasn't safe. And we were covering that. And people put their money on the table and bought subscriptions or bought digital subscriptions. Uh, and we've been able to keep a lot of them. We've, uh, so that's, that is the positive side. It's the proof of the pudding is in the eating. 
uh, we, we were able to add uh, subscriptions because people, we were delivering something people wanted. You know, and I would just, I would just also add that I think um, newspapers, public radio, digital, uh, in, in local communities are playing a role. Yes, it's about the news you deliver, but it's about a sense of community. It's about a water cooler of, you know, people talking uh, about similar things. Like everybody in Vermont is talking about the cannabis bill, <laughs> you know, and reading the, that got passed yesterday. And they read about it in the Bennington Banner. They heard about it on Vermont Public Radio and took, you know, their own take from it. But there's also, I think, at this point, when we are a nation so divided, that uh, a, a local news or local community uh, can have a different kind of conversation, one that is more civil, one that is more healing, one that is more empathetic. And I think we that often gets lost in you know a discussion of, of local news if you just look at it as coverage of a beat or something else. And I do think that that is part, a large part of why people um, will give, will contribute, will become members or subscribers. Let, let me try to keep gnawing on this question of reporter preferences and reader preferences with you, Gordon. One of the business models, as I understand this, uh, is based on the idea that we want people to click through and subscribe. So if you're working for the Los Angeles Times and you write a story about whatever California's version of the cannabis bill, cannabis bill is, they passed it a while ago. Maybe that's why they're having so many problems. I don't know. Uh, but uh, Reporters tell me it's desirable for them to get more clicks and to a certain extent their success is measured by how many of those clicks become subscribers. Does that fight against some sense of public mission? Gee, I, I, would, I don't think so, Howard. I think we've seen an evolution. Um, Ten years ago, reporters complained rightly that they were being measured on the number of page views that their articles got. And I think that led to clickbait, it led to more emotional journalism, less analytical journalism, less straight journalism. We now see, as we've been discussing, with this focus on reader revenues and memberships from readers, readers don't value um, from their local news site they don't value uh, that kind of reporting nearly as much as several categories of reporting. As Fred said, they really care about uh, hyper-local issues like, is my local hospital being overrun by COVID-19? To give that example. They care about their local sports. They care a lot about their local schools. And parents care a lot about what their kids are up to and seeing their names in pixels on websites. And to the degree that the local publishers increasingly will have the tools to measure what readers value the way the big national and global brands have had for some years now, I think what they will find is that reporters should be encouraged and measured in part by whether they're doing the kind of journalism that some categories of readers find valuable enough to be one of the reasons that they become a member or a subscriber. I think there's nothing wrong with um, encouraging journalists to think that way about readers, serving readers in that way. Um, and I think it's much healthier than the old advertising based approach. Much better to be serving what readers want than what will get advertisers a lot of readers, even if they're not that engaged with the content. Now, this is a truly interesting departure in this conversation, where what has been cast as the golden age of advertising-based journalism, Gordon is now positing that that had significant drawbacks by being untethered to reader preferences, and that shifting to this reader-based model could uh, uh, fix that uh, in some way. To, 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 how, are you, how are you feeling right now, Fred? Well, um, I want to take issue with what Gordon had to say in part. 
Um, I don't know that there's been such a shift uh, from the, what he says, uh, how it was when uh, 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 reporters were uh, writing for for face view, uh, for page views. Uh, I think they still are. I think I, I think the level of sophistication that we have, we just we just bought a new system um, to evaluate uh, our, a new content management system and, and and some new hardware to help us do analytics. And uh, given the numbers that we have in our in our uh, papers, I don't know that we'll ever get numbers that are going to show that X reporter uh, managed to convert Y number of um, lookers into subscribers. That that may be really too sophisticated for for that. I think we're going what we're going to be stuck with is how many page views we got, how many people click through from the page view to to the web, to our uh, website, those kinds of things. So the uh, and we're going to and 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 clearly th that is being used as a way to uh, evaluate the the value of of a reporter to the institutions. No question about it. And there's a good thing in giving giving readers what they want. That's what this is all about. I mean, that's how newspapers started. That's how all news. That's how ever. And, and you know, you, 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 you can't force feed people. Um, but in the quote golden age of of, of of advertising, something that happened long before I arrived on the scene at a newspaper, uh, it gave the editors and the publishers a, a wide berth to write on things and to um, not have to worry so much about what, what was paying the bills. The bills were going to get paid. You go out and find the news and write about the news. Um, and we, we, we have to be a little bit more careful now because we can't offend. It's, it's, it's harder to offend uh, when your margins are as thin as ours are. What I'm hearing you say, Gordon, people talk about the big national brands as being totally distinct. And, and I would think that many local even public radio stations would look at WNYC as having not that much to do with them because you obviously had a much bigger potential audience. But you, what you're saying, uh, I think both Gordon and Laura are saying that some of the techniques that these behemoths are figuring out can be applied if local publishers are willing to apply them. Is, is that a fair summary, Gordon? I, 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 I really empathize with Fred because I think it's very hard for local news publishers because of the lack of scale to make this leap to more focus on reader revenues. I know it's going to happen and the quality of the news is the number one issue and Fred's got that in spades. He's got great newsrooms. So I'm optimistic. But for big national or global brands, at this point, they have data that indicate this particular area of coverage accounts for n percent of my subscriptions. These kind of readers are willing to pay a price that's three times what these readers might be willing to pay. I'm only ever going to ask somebody to pay who's going to say yes at the price that maximizes the revenue to the publisher. This is the kind of discussion that's now happening at the big global brands, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, um, some digital only brands, Business Insider, for example. I'm on the board of the largest news publisher in Hong Kong, Apple Daily, which you know is is in a difficult spot given what's happening to free speech in Hong Kong. But as, soon, as soon as they as, as soon as they announced the paid model, the first paid website in Hong Kong, 10% of the population became a digital subscriber. So if you've got that kind of relationship with the community, if people understand that they're really voting with an affinity, um, then I think local news will make this shift. I am optimistic. I can't tell Fred when this shift will happen, which I know from being a publisher is really all that he can afford to care about. But I am fundamentally optimistic. Um, and I think, as we've said, that Laura's experience of public radio is a really interesting precedent for what um, other local news operations can do. So uh, in the time remaining, I'm going to abuse my position as moderator and ask Laura what I would call a hobby horse question of mine that she's familiar with. Uh, the funding model for public broadcasting, now called public media, 
has a formula for the distribution of the $445 million of federal funds that goes to the public media system every year. And by statute, 75% of it goes to television. Is there, does that make any sense anymore in your opinion, Laura? And <laughs> No, I think actually it should go at least equally to television and radio, but more importantly, uh, to those who are producing, uh, you know, really consequential programming and doing consequential service in their in their communities, I think public media has to figure out how to share infrastructure and do the kinds of things that uh, every station does to try to share uh, the cost of doing that, so that more programming uh, can be created for lo for audiences like local journalism. The money should be put into into the content, I think. And uh, I think there, is, I think it's crazy that I agree with you. I think it's crazy that, you know, the, uh, the formula, uh, both, uh, you know, if you will, penalizes public radio and also in a way penalizes those who are putting a lot of money toward local journalism. And it should be the opposite. Um, uh, go ahead. Can I just say um, one one other thing? Um, Absolutely. So, so I, I I think on the funding side, we need to find every every local journalism uh, organization needs to find what I think of as the for the newspapers the um, replacement for the classifieds and you know a third large revenue stream and whether it's events or whether it's podcasts or whether it's uh, philanthropy, I think that thinking there needs to be a chunk because otherwise it's not not going to succeed. It needs the the kind of mission-based message that will get larger larger than subscribers and it needs I think the the owners like you know I know I knew Bob, I knew I know Hans. So these are really amazing people. Mm -hmm. And then I but I will say just one last thing which is that the thing that most scares me from this conversation is Fred, when you say you can't afford to offend people, local news has to be able to, any journalism has to be able to take that risk. So I, I beg of you to, uh, and I think you did it to me last week. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have any. <laughs> no, in any case, I think that, um, I think uh, you, you, that's what local journalism needs to do, hold people to account. There's no question about it. Um, <laughs> I guess when I say we, we can't afford to offend people, we have to take into account who we are offending. We, we have to be careful. Uh, you don't do it. You, you can't be quite as cavalier now as maybe you could have been in the past. But again, I wasn't part of the of the of, of the world of journalism in those days, so I can't speak to that. But there is something I'd like to add. Something, uh, Howard, if possible, we haven't touched on, and I tell people all the Just time. Real quick, we got about a minute left. I'll take me thirty seconds. It seems to me our job as journalists now, or as, as, as owners is, we've got to convince the new, gen the younger generations that it's in, we have to convince them it's in their best interest to pay for content. The, with this concept of a free, where everything is free, I understand that you grow up with the internet where everything was free, um, and your dad pays for the, for the connection, um, it, you live that way. Uh, but it, you won't sustain journalism if people can't get beyond that, if they, people can't realize that it's in their best interest to spend money for content. Uh, one of the, uh, I'll, I'll cut it off. We've had so much to, to think about. A lot of, I think, very positive grist for our mill and, and uh, green shoots of recovery for local journalism and also a reiteration of the challenge. I, I urge our readers to Go to the NewsGuard website. We haven't given Gordon a chance to talk about the important work he's doing to help uh, people understand what is not fake news. And he's really doing that every day through a business model. We haven't talked about why the heck Laura Walker became the president of Bennington College. Uh, maybe she just wanted to get out of Brooklyn, but I kind of doubt that. Uh, and uh, I hope everybody, uh, uh, when the, when their uh, New York uh, 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 residents are up there at Jacob's Pillow and Tanglewood. Make sure you pick up the Berkshire Eagle and uh, read their excellent cultural commentary that goes along with their local local journalism. It's a great newspaper with a great name. So thank you, Fred Ruppberg, Berkshire Eagle, Gordon Krovitz, NewsGuard, Laura Walker, former New York Public Radio, now Bennington College. I'm Howard Husick, Manhattan Institute. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Thank you.